we are. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever had a dream? Has God ever given you a dream? You know, it could happen. Uh, God speaks that way. Prophecy foretells that there's coming a time when we will receive dreams. God's done it before. In 1847, a few years after the Great Disappointment, shortly before his death, God gave William Miller a dream, a dream he did not fully understand. Miller dreamed that God sent him a small, intricately designed casket made of ebony and inlaid with pearls. A key was attached, and then he opened it, and he was astonished to find it filled with jewels, Diamonds, precious stones, and coins, all arranged beautifully, reflecting uh, light as brilliant as the sun. Overjoyed, Miller placed the casket on the table and invited others to come and see its splendor. At first, a few people came in, and they were also amazed and joyful. But as the crowd grew bigger and bigger, they began to get out the jewels and touch them and, and scatter them across the table, and then eventually onto the floor and onto the furniture and throughout the room, and Miller became anxious, knowing he would be held accountable if the jewels were lost. But despite his pleas, people continued to scatter the jewels, mixing in counterfeit coins and counterfeit false jewels, and even bringing in dirt and rubbish until even the casket was destroyed, leaving him heart disheartened and in tears. The jewels were scattered, covered in dirt, seemingly lost forever. But then, in his despair, Miller prayed for help. And suddenly, a man entered with a dirt brush. He opened the windows and began cleaning the room. He reassured Miller not to fear that he would take care of the lost jewels. And as he swept away the dirt, he also removed the false jewels and the counterfeit coins. And now he placed a new casket, even larger and more beautiful, on the table and effortlessly placed the jewels back in perfect order. The sight was dazzling, and Miller describes he was so excited to see it that he shouted for joy and woke up. In the dream... As in life, Miller had experienced a great disappointment. But Miller's dream suggested that God was now doing a work to gather the scattered jewels that had been scattered across and to reassemble them into something even more beautiful than the Millerite movement he had been the head of. There were truths of Scripture which were brought out to everyone's attention through the Millerite movement. We've looked at that over the past weeks of the influence it's had on American religion. Truths of Scripture, however, were also to be regained through this recollection process, which we will consider through the remaining three messages of this series. Truths which Jesus, the master sweeper, dusted off and placed more prominently in his casket than ever before. And isn't that the beauty of the gospel? That though we fall and fail, though we are utterly ruined, yet if we will let him, our Savior comes to clean us up and make us beautiful again. Isn't this the promise he's given to our world that polluted and stained and destroyed by sin as it is, yet Jesus is coming again to restore our world, to make it whole with a new heaven and a new earth. Just like the sweeper cleaning the room, bringing out a more beautiful casket. And wouldn't it be beautiful if the same transformation could take place in our nation today? What if I told you that there was one specific jewel in that casket given to Miller, one specific truth which appeared amid the Millerite movement, one specific truth which could make America great again? What if I told you it was a truth about worship and the Sabbath? Last week, we considered how the aftermath of the great disappointment led Advent believers to discover new truths in Scripture. They had expected Jesus to come. It was sweet as honey in the mouth, but when Jesus didn't come, it was bitter in the belly. Yet as Revelation 10 foretold, it was predicted to happen. And yet the angel said afterward, don't worry about it, you must get up and prophesy again. It was as if Jesus, the master sweeper, had come into the dirt-laden room 
and he had begun recollecting the jewels and placing them in a new casket bigger and better than before. Edson, Hiram Edson, who we'd looked at last week, discovered what was wrong. The biblical sanctuary of Daniel 8.14 to be cleansed was not on the earth. It was the cleansing which would begin in heaven's sanctuary. In this way, Scripture directed the minds of the early Advent believers to see the temple of God in heaven, the ark of his covenant in his temple. You noticed that the past two Sabbaths, this has been the Scripture reading for both Sabbaths. And that's because as Scripture pointed the believers here to the ark of God in the temple, it referred both to the sanctuary we talked about last week and the Sabbath, which we are talking about today. The ark of the covenant is the seat of God's government. It is a throne of mercy. It sits under two covering cherubs, but underneath that mercy seat sits a law of love. Specifically, the Ten Commandments, which God spoke with his own mouth and wrote with his own finger on tables of stone. And so when the ark of God was revealed in his temple to the second advent believers, it wasn't long before they looked at that ark and they were forced to contemplate the Ten Commandments inside. At the heart of the Ten Commandments stands the fourth, a most precious jewel which had to be recovered. You see, the Ten Commandments, just like the sanctuary in general, have always been about seeing God's character more clearly. When the Israelites were in Egypt and they were slaves in Egypt, Pharaoh made them work 24-7, day after day after day. He refused to let them go even one day, which was Moses' first request. He wouldn't even let them go one day on the Sabbath day to worship God. And so God sent Moses to deliver them with plagues and miracles. But notice his purpose. Exodus 19 says, You've seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt because ultimately he wanted to bring them to himself. He wanted to bring them to be like him so that they could worship him. No wonder one of the first things the children of Israel do is they assemble around the plain of Sinai and there, as they worship God at the height of their worship service with clouds surrounding the mountain with thunder and lightning, God speaks with thunder. The people were afraid. They were terrified. And what does he say? What does he call out from the mountain? He recites the Ten Commandments to them from up in the heavens. These commandments were the way in which the people were to honor and worship God, to love the Lord their God with all their heart, mind, and soul, and to love their neighbor as their self. God brought the children of Israel out of the bondage of slavery so that they could worship him in freedom by keeping his commandments. Now, at the founding of America, God actually did the exact same thing. We've seen in this series how this nation was the result of dissenting Protestants, meaning they were persecuted, they were not part of the main church, fleeing persecutions in Europe. We call them pilgrims. And they saw themselves, we looked at times when they called themselves out as those persecuted saints in Scripture. They saw themselves as the fulfillment of Revelation 12, when it describes God's church as a persecuted woman. But she escapes to America, figured in Scripture as the earth. Just as God rescued the Israelites so he could show himself to them so they could worship him rightly and keep his commandments, so too God rescued the persecuted saints of Europe and brought them to America so they could experience freedom which would enable them to keep the commandments of God. Whether in ancient Israel or today, America was God's plan to bring a people to himself. It was God looking for a people who would keep the commandments of God as a way of worshiping him, as a way of being brought to him. Because God is love. His commandments are love. There's no daylight between God and his commandments because they're a transcript of his character. No surprise then that God's people on this earth have always been those who purposed in their heart to keep the law of God. We noted in this series that it was precisely the zealous desire of men like Isaac Backus and Jacob Green to keep the commandments of God, which led them to object to the cardinal sin of America, namely slavery. 
Slavery was a sin against loving one's neighbor as thyself, and it was the desire to keep the commandments of God which enabled people in that time when it was unpopular to stand up and say, this is wrong. But if there was one other commandment which must which had most been covered in dirt, trodden down and trampled underfoot. If there was one jewel which most needed restoring into the casket, if there was one commandment whose blatant disregard is a sin against loving the Lord with all one's heart, mind, and soul, it was the fourth commandment, which reads, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, not even those under your authority. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. The Sabbath was not given exclusively to the Jews. It was given to all humanity at creation. When God made the heavens and the earth in six days and rested the seventh, then he blessed it and made it holy as a gift to all humanity, a day to remember him as the creator, a day set aside for worship. But were there early Americans who kept the seventh-day Sabbath? Is the seventh-day Sabbath American? First off, let's just clarify that there have always been Christians who kept the seventh-day Sabbath. Of course, the Bible describes that Jesus kept the Sabbath and Paul kept the Sabbath, even with the Gentile and Greek Christians, New Covenant believers, Gentile Christians, yet they all kept the Seventh-day Sabbath, Scripture says, as their custom was. But even in the early church, the practice of observing the Seventh-day Sabbath was commonplace until a series of persecutions brought about compromise. Eventually, the Roman papacy, in conjunction with the emperors of Rome, made a Sunday law that anyone not observing Sunday as the Sabbath should be threatened with death. Thus, the Roman church claims to this very day that it transferred the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. It's a mark of their authority. But there have always been Christians in every age, in hidden pockets, beyond the reaches of the bishop of Rome, who bore witness to the true Sabbath. In Ethiopia and Armenia, in Ireland and Scandinavia, and in the hidden wilderness of the Waldensian Mountains. Indeed, although they were viciously persecuted and attempts were made to root out their memory from the face of the earth, yet the historical record remains intact that there were always some who kept the Seventh day Sabbath. And these Seventh day Sabbath keepers reemerge with increased visibility just as the pilgrims are anticipating their flight to America. The pilgrims who left for America in 1620 were part of a larger group of English separatists, many of whom were Baptists, and of those Baptists, many of whom also observed the Seventh-day Sabbath. The first church, which practiced baptism by immersion in the Baptist tradition, The pastor was keeping the seventh-day Sabbath. The historical record bears out that in England, almost all English Baptist churches before the 1660s contained some members or pastors who observed the seventh-day Sabbath. And in North America, that pattern continued. You'll remember Roger Williams. Remember, he was the one who talked about how there was this separation between church and state, that the first four commandments were a duty that humans had to God, and so the government shouldn't have anything to do with those commandments. And the the, the last six commandments were were duty bound to each other, and that's what the government could make laws about. Anyway, you'll remember how influential he was in establishing Rhode Island and in and in uh, increasing in the growing American continent uh, the idea that we should protect freedom of religion. But what's probably less familiar to you is that Roger Williams also assisted another Baptist preacher by the name of John Clark in founding the first Baptist church of Newport, Rhode Island, a church which contained several Baptist families who observed the Seventh-day Sabbath. For decades, the Seventh-day Sabbath Baptists and the the regular Baptists, although we should wonder why it came to be that, why aren't the Seventh-day Sabbaths the regular Baptists and then the the, the First-day Baptists anyway? But they were all worshiping together in the same church. In fact, in 1668, 
When Boston held a debate, the Puritans in Boston held a public debate about whether or not there should be separation of church and state, the Baptists had to decide who would go and represent them and the state of Rhode Island in this debate. And they chose three people to represent them in favor of freedom of religion. And wouldn't you know that two of the three representatives for the Baptists, 66% of those arguing in favor of separation of church and state and freedom of religion, were Seventh-day Sabbath keepers. Their names were Samuel Hubbard and William Hiscox. You see, the Seventh-day Sabbath has always stood for freedom. For the children of Israel, it was freedom from the tyranny of work under Pharaoh. For us today, the Sabbath is resting by faith in the word of Christ who blessed it and made it holy. And so it is no surprise to find that Seventh-day Sabbath keepers have always been at the forefront of freedom of religion and liberty, which made this nation so great in the first place. The Seventh-day Baptists were always a minority, but by no means a trivial minority. Their ideas were loud enough that Jonathan Edwards preached an entire sermon on them in 1730. There were enough of them that George Whitfield went out of his way to take correspondence with them to understand their beliefs. The truth is that it doesn't take a majority to influence public discussion. Let's never forget that. We don't need to be in a majority to influence public discussion. We just need to use the voice and influence that God has given us. What a tragedy it is, however, when we sit on our voice and sit on our influence, and watch and wave as this world goes down the drain. Let that never be said of us. I don't have time this morning to share all that could be shared about early Sabbath keepers in America. But what I want you to see and understand this morning is that from the very beginning of this nation, it was a minority of Baptists dissenting Christians who argued for freedom of religion. And as we saw, even though they weren't the majority of the founding fathers, yet it was their ideas that the founding fathers took and influenced the freedom of religion that has made this nation so great, the liberties and freedoms which we enjoy. But what I also want you to see this morning is that among this group of Baptists who were arguing in favor of freedom of religion, there was a healthy contingent of those who were also keeping the Seventh-day Sabbath. These Seventh-day Sabbath keepers would continue on composing more than 15,000 people in 1811. And in 1843, one of them, a Seventh-day Baptist woman named Rachel Oakes, attended a Millerite church where the pastor, Frederick Wheeler, was preaching about the Ten Commandments. The Millerites believed Jesus was coming, like right away. And so in anticipation of Jesus' return, Wheeler said, we need to be keeping all the commandments of God. Well, Rachel Oakes was sitting there. She could hardly contain herself. She was antsy in her seat. How could this guy be preaching about this on Sunday? How could this Millerite preacher be saying that everyone should be keeping the commandments and he himself is observing the wrong day? After the service, Rachel gave Wheeler a piece of her mind. You're a hypocrite. Wheeler was astonished. But as he went back and studied his Bible, he had to admit she was telling the truth. Wheeler then began to keep and preach about the Sabbath by 1844. T.M. Preble, another Millerite preacher, picked up the Sabbath. He published a tract about it, which influenced yet another Millerite preacher, an old sea captain named Joseph Bates. Bates would meet up with Hiram Edson, who we talked about last week, to learn the truth about the heavenly sanctuary, And putting these two truths together about the sanctuary and the Sabbath, Joseph Bates became the first founder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. He published his own tract on the Sabbath entitled A Perpetual Sign. He argued the Seventh-day Sabbath was a sign of love and loyalty to God since the creation of the world. Since the 1600s, Seventh-day Sabbath keepers, such as Thomas Tillam, had long argued that Sunday worship was the mark of the beast. But now Joseph Bates came to argue that the Seventh-day Sabbath was the seal of God, described in Revelation, because the Sabbath was the only commandment which stated both the giver of the command and the reason for his authority. But is this debate over the Sabbath and Sunday today really a prefigure of Revelation's mark and seal to come? 
And how does America fit into all of this? Revelation 13 reads, Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. We've looked at this verse before. We've seen how these shores of America, the place, the earth to which the persecuted Christians had fled, also came to have a beast rise out of it. That is the United States of America, the the power, a beast describing the nation. We noted that the United States had power like a lamb. It enshrined freedom of religion and governed by consent of the people. What a good form of government. And yet we also noted there has always been a hypocritical side to this nation, speaking as a dragon. We looked at how that was evident in the way it instituted slavery, breaking the last six of the commandments. Slavery not only betrayed America's founding principles, but it was an affront to the commandments of God. But the Constitution also violated another commandment of God. One that had to do with the first four commandments. One that had to do specifically with worship. And people are beginning to take note of this. I forgot to bring them this morning, but I was going to bring a series of books. Recently published books within the, first, the last three to five years. It's happening. And these books are by scholars. Titles like, How to Bring America Back to God. How to Understand that the United States is a Christian Nation. And in these books, they point out that in the Constitution itself, it specifically calls out Sunday as a day when work isn't done. It says, for example, that Congress, when it makes a law, it has five days to get that to the president, unless one of those days is Sunday because it's a day of rest. And they are then using this argument to suggest we need to go back to our roots. Revelation 13 continues. It says that this beast power, the United States, will exercise all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. We already noted in this series how dissenting Protestants, the ones who had fled, the pilgrims, the American Protestants who founded this nation, they all knew and all agreed that the first beast of Revelation 13 was the Roman papacy. It was even printed in the commentary of the Geneva Bible, as as was pointed out the other Sabbath. We also note that in 1798, the papal rule came to an end with the capture of Pope Napoleon's general and the destruction of the papal states. But the Vatican was reinstated in 1929, and thus the deadly wound was healed. And in our time, with both the United States and the Vatican as real existing entities in today's world, Revelation describes that the United States would perform signs so that he makes even fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs, which he was granted to do in the sight of the first beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast, who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should be both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark, the beast, uh, the name of the beast, or the number of his name. What is depicted in these texts is that somehow the United States of America is using and will use even more its influence and power around the world to increase the influence of the Roman Catholic Church, specifically with regard to its ability to encourage worship. And there's coming a day when the whole world will be pressed to receive the mark of her authority, namely the observance of Sunday as the Sabbath. Notice the key issue will be about worship. They will enforce a Sunday law. Notice that since Sunday is a day made holy by man and the power of the church, it is not a worship day of freedom. Sunday is a worship day of tyranny and force and coercion. Throughout history, the institution of Sunday as a day of worship has always been one that was pressured by force. It is the opposite of the seventh-day Sabbath, which has always been inspired and invited by a God who asks us to take him at his word. 
Sunday is a type of salvation by human works, righteousness by works, making holy what God did not make holy. The seventh day Sabbath is a day of worship dedicated to faith in God's word. What he says he blessed and made holy, independent of whatever I experience. Even now, forces are being arrayed, which will compel people to observe a Sunday worship day. Over and against them, however, will be a different people, also with a message about worship. Depicted in Revelation 14, these people have the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. Notice that this is also a call to worship, but not to worship willy-nilly, however I please. But if I'm going to worship him, then I must worship him as he asks to be worshiped, as the creator. And how do you worship God as the creator who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water? Well, you worship him on the day that he set apart and sanctified at creation, according to the fourth commandment, which says that the reason we should keep the Sabbath is because in that day, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, the springs, and all that is in them in those six days, and then he rested on the seventh day, blessed it, and hallowed it as a memorial of that work. But there's more to our message. The Bible says we have a message to call people out of the fallen church of Rome and her influences. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. No city is greater in her spiritual influence than Rome. And soon her influence will be pressed upon the world on the issue of Sabbath with all power. But a third angel warns, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. By contrast is the patience of the saints who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. These are the ones who will receive the seal of God as opposed to the mark of the beast. Notice, though, that the seal is only ever given to those people on the head. The mark is given both the head and the hand. Doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. If being forced and coerced and pressured into observing Sunday, being neutral, doing nothing will not be enough. In a moment soon to come, we will need to take a decided stand for Christ, the Lord of the Sabbath. We don't know when, We don't know the exact mechanism which will trigger it, but we see the signs pointing to the fact that this prophecy of Scripture is soon to be fulfilled. The Vatican has repeatedly been calling for the observing of a legally enforced Sunday as a day of rest, as a way to save the collapsing environment. Ever since Laudato Si, it's encyclical, I think in 2019 or whenever it was, it's been ramping up the pressure. Even in our current presidential cycle. Project 2025, a supporting document of the Republican Party platform, suggests, and I'm quoting to you here what it says, Sabbath rest. God ordained the Sabbath as a day of rest, and until very recently the Judean Christian tradition sought to honor that mandate by moral and legal regulation of work on that day. In other words, they're saying God ordained the Sabbath, and we should make sure that people are regulated that we have legal laws about how they can work on the Sabbath. Congress should encourage communal rest by amending the Fair Labor Standards Act to require that workers be paid time and a half for hours worked on the Sabbath. That day would default to Sunday. And it's not that we don't know or that they don't know about us. In fact, right underneath this, they go on to talk about how we know there are some who keep Sabbath from Friday night to Saturday night, and we will give them pay for working, uh, they'll, they'll be able to work on their day, but they'll get paid one and a half times, which of course the employers won't want to do. But you see, this is exactly what happened in the early church. It started with small increments, and then the laws get more and more aggressive. I'm just, my perspective growing up, who would have thought anyone in America would be in favor of making these kinds of laws? 
no one was talking about it. Whether this is a lunatic, lunatic far-right fringe or not, the fact is, it's crazy people are talking about this. But such a move is not new in American history. It is the continuation of the same great controversy struggle between the impulses of the lamb and the impulses of the dragon which are ever present in our nation. Just as with slavery, our nation was willing to violate its fundamental, pr fundamental principles, so too some people in this nation are increasingly willing to violate the fundamental principles of this nation to set up a Sunday rest as a vehicle for worship. In 1888, this guy, the senator of New Hampshire, Henry Blair, took before the United States Congress a law to enforce Sunday as a national day of rest. At that time, there was a Seventh-day Adventist who stood up before the Senate committee hearing by the name of Alonzo T. Jones. Jones argued against the bill enforcing Sunday worship, and he said, look, God says to render the things Caesar, the things that are Caesar's, and to God, the things that are God's. In other words, God made the separation between church and state. Jesus, this was Jesus' idea. Senator Blair replied, he said, if Caesar is society and the Sabbath is required for the good of society, does not God require us to establish the Sabbath for the good of society? A.T. Jones replied. I mean, how would you reply if you were standing before the Senate committee hearing? He said, it is for the good of society that men shall be Christians, but it is not in the province of the state to make Christians. Of all men in the world, Americans ought to be the last to deny that the powers that be, although ordained of God, are not ordained of God in anything pertaining to a single duty and joined in one of the first four of the Ten Commandments. Notice what he's doing there. He's relying on Roger Williams all those years ago at the founding of our nation who had said those first four commandments, government's got no right to legislate on those. These are the duties that men owe to God, not to Caesar. This Sunday bill does propose to legislate in regard to the Lord's Day. If it is the Lord's Day, we are to render it to the Lord, not to Caesar. When Caesar exacts it of us, he is exacting what does not belong to him and is demanding of us that which he should have nothing to do. If this bill were in favor of enforcing the observance of the seventh day as the Lord's Day, we would still oppose it just as much as we oppose it now for the reason that civil government has nothing to do with what we owe to God or whether we owe anything or not or whether we pay it or not. Senator Blair said, well, you oppose all the Sunday laws of the country then. Mr. Jones said, yes, sir. You are against all the Sunday laws? Yes, sir. Every one that has ever been made in this world, from the first enacted by Constantine to this one now proposed. And we would be equally against the Sabbath law if it were proposed, for that would be anti-Christian too. State and national alike? State and national, sir. I shall give you historical reasons presently. George Washington said, Every man who conducts himself as a good citizen is accountable to God for his religious faith and is to be protected, to be protected in worshiping God according to the dictates of his own conscience. Senator Blair, you deny the right of the majority, in other words, to make a law in conformity with what the whole society shall practice? I deny the right of any civil government to make any law respecting anything that pertains to man's relationship to his God under the first four of the Ten Commandments. I wish here to show further that this is not only the principle of the word of Jesus Christ, but also of the American Constitution. Our national constitution embodies the very principle announced by Jesus Christ that civil government shall have nothing to do with religion, but shall leave that to every man's conscience. As long as he is a good citizen, the nation will protect him and leave him perfectly free to worship whom he pleases, when he pleases, as he pleases, or not to worship at all, if he pleases. Now, eventually, Blair's bill advancing Sunday law was defeated. But the prophecies of Scripture foretell that the debate between Jones and Blair was but a dress rehearsal. Soon, you and I will take place in the real thing. 
I recognize that as I have been standing before you week after week suggesting that America is great when it extends and expounds on the idea of religious freedom. That's what I've been saying week after week is that America is great when it stands for religious freedom and that if we want it to be great, we go back to religious freedom. You may think that's how all Americans today see it. But I want you to consider for a few minutes that in pulpits across this nation, Many Christians are being fed a very different narrative about what America is and what will make this nation great again. I want you to consider for just a few minutes just one example from a pulpit just a month ago in Prescott, Arizona. Now, the title of our sermon this morning is How a Sabbath-Keeping Church Transforms a Society. That's a bold title, but I think it's true. And hopefully this morning, you'll see that it's true. Now, a principle we have to keep in mind right off the bat is that the Lord blesses a Sabbath-keeping society, the Lord blesses a society that values the Sabbath, and the Lord curses a society that does not keep the Sabbath, that has no value on the Sabbath. The Lord blesses a people that keep the Sabbath day, and he cuts off a people that do not. We in America used to be a people that knew what this meant. We used to know how to keep the Sabbath day holy. In America, we used to have laws that regulated our Sunday mornings and our whole Sunday gathering. These laws are known as blue laws. These laws forbade regular work on Sundays. You couldn't go to your job on Sundays. It was illegal. It also forbade any buying, selling, traveling, any public entertainment or sports. Many of these laws are still in place today. In my old home state in Indiana, I grew up remembering people who were frustrated because they couldn't buy alcohol on Sunday before they went to the Colts game. That's a distinct memory in my mind. These blue laws are still in effect. They're still part of our, our present life. In North Dakota, there's a law that says, quote, large retail stores shall not be open until noon on Sunday, end quote. This is obviously to encourage Sunday morning worship. You need to go to church in North Dakota, not go to the store. These laws have become more of a rarity for us today than a norm. This idea of leading a culture through legislation, leading a culture through legislation, leading a culture through legislation is foreign in our minds. It was not in early America, but for us today, this is a hard concept. We don't like it when there's restrictions placed on what we can and cannot do. There's an aversion in our hearts to hear from anybody what we're allowed to do or not allowed to do on Sunday. We want to go to Costco. We want to shop on Amazon. We want to be able to go pick up beer before the Colts game. These are things that we want to do, and we don't like it when these laws butt in the way. But the question is, should we be doing these things? Should we be going to Costco? Should we be shopping on Amazon? Chick-fil-A is known for their Sabbath keeping. They're known for their chicken sandwiches. They're known for their awesome sauce. But they're also equally known for their Sunday morning or their Sunday day abstinence from business. Yet Chick-fil-A is one of the most profitable businesses in the fast food industry. Why? Because the Lord is blessing them. He's blessing them for their Sabbath observance. Chick-fil-A has the idea. We want our children to do these laws, to live according to God's laws. We have to be able to say things like, if you want to love God, you'll keep the fourth commandment. You'll keep the Sabbath day holy. God rested on the seventh day to give you a pattern to model your life after. That's why he rested on the seventh day. This leads us to our second question this morning of when is the Sabbath? When do we observe the Sabbath day? It's important to note here that worship and Sabbath have always gone together. Jesus obviously intended for worship and Sabbath keeping to go together. So we too have to make them go together. We worship God this morning on Sunday because Sabbath and worship go together. When Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and rose from the grave on the third day, the first day of the week, he started a new creation. It's clear that this day, Sunday, became the day for the early church. This has been one of the rare points of unity in church history and across almost all Christian denominations, apart from the weird Seventh-day Adventists, apart from the weird Seventh-day Adventists, weird Seventh-day Adventists, All Christians, whether you're Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, Protestant, all different types of Protestants, we all gather and worship God on the first day, on Sunday. We're unified in this. When we neglect the law, the world neglects the law. If we don't value the law, why on earth would those who don't have Christ value the law? We have to see the societal implications of Sabbath keeping. We have to see that not just your own personal relationship with the Lord is at stake in your Sabbath keeping, but all of our community is at stake. We have to see that when we keep the Sabbath as a church, we're teaching Prescott what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a Sabbath-keeping Prescott. We don't just want general Christian culture. We want Christian laws 
We want Christian laws. We want laws that reflect God's good law. We want Sabbath laws. We want Sabbath laws. We don't just want less blue laws, we want more blue laws. We want laws that teach our culture. We know that laws control a society, but there's something else that equally controls a society. Those that are in control of the calendar have equal control and say in a society. The homosexuals understand this. They get it. What month are we in? Pride month. They have a whole month. They understand that if they can get a society to celebrate something, if they can get a society to celebrate sin and degradation, that the society will follow. And is it not? Are we not following that pattern? We have to shift our mindset and understand that we are to take dominion of the calendar. We need to think this way. God has called you to go and get the nations. Through the Great Commission, God has told you to go into the world and get the nations. You have to see Sabbath keeping as part of this dominion mandate. You have to see it as part of our call to go into the world, to preach the gospel message, and to live the Christian life. It's your mandate. And I encourage you, Christian, to go and do it. His message is a sign of the time that we are living in. First, he suggests that nations and societies are blessed if they keep the Sabbath and cursed if they don't. He suggests that society as a whole, society as a whole needs to keep the Sabbath. He suggests that the culture should be led through legislation and even suggests that it's a good part of American history that we have Sunday blue laws. Third, he specifically calls on Sunday laws to draw down commerce so that there's no buying or selling on Sunday. Fourth, he agrees that Sunday is the Sabbath because it is the day to worship. Notice his emphasis on worship. Fifth, he argues that all Christians, except the weird Seventh-day Adventists, support this. He dismisses Seventh-day Adventists not on the merit of our ideas, but simply with a pejorative slur. They are weird, an ad hominem attack. Sixth, he ends by an appeal, did you notice it, to control culture, to go out and have dominion over the nations by controlling the calendar. He claims that this control is part of the Great Commission. It goes all the way back to Augustine, who we've looked at, who said compel them to come in and then justified the Roman bishop for making laws against Sabbath keepers in those days. This is what's happening in the pulpits of your neighbors. It is not a coincidence that these arguments which are being played out before, which have been played out before in American history, are being agitated by some again today. It is evidence that Jesus is coming soon. The hour of probation for this nation is coming to a close. Soon there will be no more time left to decide. Soon any chance to switch allegiances from Satan to Christ will only come at the most awful of earthly costs. If you are not in allegiance to Christ this morning, do not pass up this opportunity right now to repent of your sin, to turn to Jesus and live. Turn away from the lusts and evils that ensnare you. Throw yourself at his gracious and loving feet. Pledge to him your life, your all. Ask him to do the work in you which you cannot do for yourself, to keep the commandments of God in both spirit and truth. The Sabbath is God's sign of love and loyalty, of faith in his promises rather than a human salvation by works project or forcing morality. The Seventh-day Sabbath represents a worship that springs from the heart, not coerced, but freely given. The Sabbath represents freedom, the same freedom that this nation was founded upon, the same freedom which made this nation great and the only freedom which can ensure that she's great today. The Sabbath is the sign of freedom which must be received by every American who will make it through the persecution ahead. Today, if it is your desire to keep the Seventh-day Sabbath, then I would invite you to stand. And as we prepare to sing, perhaps as the piano begins to play, I'd like you to contemplate your heart in God's presence for just a moment. Are you keeping the commandments of God? Are the fruits of His Spirit evident in your life? Are there any ways in which 
you dishonor him? Are there any ways that the Spirit of God might be prevented from sealing you for the crisis to come? Are there any cherished sins you need to surrender? If so, right now, will you pray a prayer of surrender and repentance? Will you lay them down in surrender to the King of Heaven? Today, he's inviting you to give your heart wholly to him before it's too late. Just as he invited Noah and his family into the ark, just as he invited Lot and his family to flee Sodom, he's inviting you and me. Get out of Sodom. Come into the ark. Don't wait until it's too late. Maybe there's someone here or maybe there's someone watching online who needs to make a decision in the sight of God to turn away from your commandment breaking. With every head bowed, and every eye closed. Maybe you want to raise your hand to heaven right now. Say, Lord, please forgive me for breaking your commandments. Please forgive me for my sins. I am yours. Please save me. Amen. Wherever Americans walk in the freedom of the Seventh-day Sabbath, desiring to keep the commandments of God, there America is truly great. and defend you, shield you, and encourage you, and keep you until that day when he comes again. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.